Before we get started this morning, I might just take just a second to say to everyone who's been so faithful this year, God bless you. Amen. You know, 2023 has been a wonderful, wonderful year. And uh, there's been a lot of weird things happening in 2023, but a lot of good things. We reached a lot of milestones at our church this year, and I'm excited for that. And so as we kind of stand on the cusp of 2024, I really can't wait to see what's in store. I was telling the guys at men's prayer meeting, I think 2024 is going to be an exciting year. In, in some ways, good, and in some ways, I'm a little bit nervous. It's an election year. There's no telling what's going to happen. But, uh, but I know this, I, I'm, I'm still looking forward to it because I know the Lord. And I'm excited for what God is going to do in our church and through our church. And uh, there's a lot of good things coming. So I really can't wait to see how it's going to shake out. But today, with it being New Year's Eve and having already broken our series through Luke last Sunday for our Christmas Eve uh, message, I thought today would be a good opportunity to do something I haven't done in, in a long time, and that is to go back and preach on spiritual New Year's resolutions. I used to do this every year, but I went back and looked at my files. I haven't preached on New Year's resolutions in six years. So at least that's what my files say. So if I am mistaken, you can correct me later. But nevertheless, I thought this would be an important thing to do. And, uh, you know, New Year's resolutions are not as, not as popular, I guess, as they once were. Maybe they are. Maybe I'm just not as plugged in as I once was uh, to them. But I don't hear about them as much as I used to. But still, New Year's resolutions are familiar to most of us. And many of us have doubtless already made one. I know in my own case... Um, I have eaten way too much over the holiday season. Come on. Am I alone? A few of you are honest. The rest of you need to be honest in church. Okay? And truth be told, it hasn't just been over the holidays. <laughs> uh, you know, actually it's been going on for a while now. And so many people have decided that, uh, you know, 2024 is the year we're going to do something about it. Right? We're going to, you know, how many of you have already made a New Year's resolution that you're going to Diet and exercise, at least one of those two. I see head shaking, hands raised. Good job, all right? I'm, good. I'm glad with that. And so, uh, you know, I'm proud of that. That's a, that's a good thing. You ought to be uh, proud of that because in our text this morning, no less than the Apostle Paul himself commends that behavior. You don't believe me? Take your Bible and open to 1 Timothy chapter 4, would you? 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll show you something. <clears throat> Even the Apostle Paul says what you're planning to do is a good thing. Look at what he says here. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. He says, bodily exercise profiteth. Amen? It's good for you. It is wonderful. Bodily exercise profiteth. It profiteth little, but... <laughs> But there is benefit in it. Amen? But can I show you something that he says is actually very profitable? Back up one verse. He says, but rather exercise thyself unto what? Unto godliness. Now that, friends, is very, very profitable. Uh, so let's pray this morning, and I want to preach to you a message urging you to make a spiritual New Year's resolution. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. And God, thankful that you tell us exactly the kind of decisions that we need to make if we want to, to grow in our faith, grow in our relationship with you. And so I pray that you'll help us to, to be the kind of people that are willing to make changes, uh, to do the things that you ask us to do for the sake of godliness. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. This is a good set of verses. Refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Right? So these are two great, great verses. Now, there's some interesting things going on in this, in this passage. 
In fact, the Greek word that is translated exercise, you see that same word, it's translated the same way in both verses, verse 7 and 8. And that Greek word that's translated exercise is the word gymnasia. Gymnasia. Now, obviously, we get several English words from this, including gymnasium. Gymnastics is another word that comes from this. And if we think about it, it's the perfect word. The word gymnasia means to train or to discipline oneself, or as it's rendered here, to exercise. That's what the word means. So, beloved, just as there are some physical exercises that you can do to help your body get in shape, to help you lose weight and have an overall uh, more healthy life, there are also some spiritual exercises that you can do to help you grow in godliness. And that is what Paul is emphasizing here. Now, truth be told, there are actually dozens of spiritual disciplines that we could add to the list to help us grow in godliness. There's tons of things that, that are a part of this, such as prayer. I almost preached on prayer this morning. I just didn't want to. I don't like to pray, man. Prayer is hard work. Some of you have never tried to pray. I know that because you didn't say amen. Because if you had tried to pray, you would know prayer is hard work. It's not easy to pray, to discipline yourself, to spend time with God and have meaningful prayer. Most of us can pray all the way around the world in about 30 seconds. And then we run out of things to say. And so to learn how to pray properly and and scripturally and in in a meaningful and helpful way is a hard discipline. So I thought about that. Stewardship is another spiritual discipline. Making sure that we are honoring God with our finances or our time or whatever resources that we uh, that he's given to us, we ought to be using those for his glory and his benefit. Amen. Amen. Stewardship is a spiritual discipline, as is faithfulness in worship. Yeah. Right? God is worthy to be worshipped week in and week out. Yeah. We, we need that spiritual discipline. There's nothing more refreshing and wholesome for the mind and the spirit than to spend time worshipping our creator. And so that is a very profound spiritual discipline. Evangelism is another discipline. We are, the only reason God hasn't already taken us to heaven is because he wants us to be sharing the gospel truth with others who don't yet know him, right? And so these are all spiritual disciplines that are wonderful for us, and we could go on and on and add many other things to the list. However, of all the spiritual disciplines, the most foundational Probably the most important for that reason, because it's the, it's the foundation for everything else. The most important spiritual discipline, I'm going to argue, is Bible intake. You need the Word of God in your life. You need the Word of God in your life. It controls how you think. It controls how you feel. It controls everything about your Christian life comes from our relationship with God's Word. Bible intake is absolutely crucial. It is literally impossible to have a complete and healthy spiritual life if this is missing. If Bible intake is not a regular part of your life, then your spiritual life, no matter what you think, it is not actually healthy. Okay? It has to be that way. Now, I know that some of you are already doing this. Some of you have a regular habit. You're getting up every morning or whatever time you've set aside in the day, and you're spending time with God's Word. And if so, I commend you for that. But some of you are like me, and that is you have a tendency to start well and then to slowly kind of slip out of the habit. You know what's going to happen? Right now, tomorrow, there are going to be so many people because that have joined Planet Fitness or whatever fitness gym is uh, of their choice, and tomorrow and for the next month, man, the gyms are going to be cram-packed. You're not going to be able to find a treadmill or a Stairmaster or whatever else. You're going to go in there, and all these people are going to have made the decision to start getting healthy and losing weight. But about the middle of February, you'll have your pick of whatever machine you want. Come on. We all know it's true because all of us are good at starting things, but we have a hard time following through. We slowly slip out of the habit. And so if that's the case with you and your Bible reading, I'm here today to just encourage you to just get back up, get back on the horse, so to speak, and let's start again. Amen? Amen. This is a perfect opportunity. Let's start again and get back in the habit of taking in God's Word. So is everybody with me this morning? All right, let's get started with this. There are actually several ways for God's Word to get into you. 
right? Several different ways for God's word to get into you. But perhaps the easiest, and yet ironically, one of the most important is simply by hearing God's word. Hearing God's word. No, I'm not talking about, you know, playing it in your car or listening to it on your phone, even though I like to do both of those things. I mean, I, I like to do both of those things. I take the Bible and I have it on my phone, turn it on in the car and just listen. A lot to books or whatever else. It's a great habit. I love to do that, but that's not actually what I'm talking about this morning. What I'm talking about is listening to the word of God as it is being read or taught publicly, as we're doing right now. And so you're off to a good start. This actually happens automatically if you faithfully attend a Bible preaching church. Amen. It is a good thing for you to come and listen to the word of God being preached. And so just being here this morning, you're already off to a good start on this spiritual discipline because you're going to be hearing the word of God taught and be challenged by that. That is something that every Christian needs. It is not a good thing to go to a church where the Bible is never opened. Amen? Okay? It's not a good thing. You want to go to a place and you want to have the Bible read and taught and be doing that. However, I would say this, merely listening to God's inspired words is not really the point. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse number 28, he said, blessed are they that hear the word of God and what? Keep it. The whole purpose of listening to the word of God and having, taking in the Bible is that we might be obedient to what God says. And as we listen to God's word, and as we begin to put it into practice week after week after coming to hear the scriptures taught, that is how we begin to develop in Christ-likeness. We grow spiritually as a result of implementing what we are taught at, uh, when the Bible is preached. But nevertheless, the method that Jesus encourages in this verse is simply hearing God's word as it is faithfully proclaimed. So, who knew that spiritual discipline could be so easy? Amen? This is the original sit and be fit. You just come here and sit in the pews and you're getting fit spiritually by this process, all right? And so I'm thankful for that. Anyway, there's much more to Bible intake than merely coming to church and listening to the Bible read and preached. And the reason there's more to it is because that method is passive. That method is passive. You're not actually doing anything I'm doing something by reading the Bible to you and teaching that, okay? That's passive. The most obvious next step is to become active, to go beyond having it fed to you and learn to feed yourself. That's the goal. And by learning to feed yourself, I mean, of course, reading the Bible on your own. You need to be taking the Bible on your own. Now, you might think this morning that, well, this doesn't need to be a New Year's resolution for Christians. I mean, surely a group of people that claims to be following Christ, a group of people who claims to be following God and to be God's children would naturally want to read the only book in the world that tells us about him. You would think so, but alas, <laughs> such is not the case. In fact, this week I was doing some research on the latest data on this. There's all kinds of companies that keep track of this. The latest Pew Research shows that even among, listen to this, even among people who attend church every week, right? So these are not your, you know, C&E crowd. This is not the Christmas and Easter only crowd. These are people who come to, faithful, come to church faithfully, week in, week out, every week they're in church. And of that crowd, only, full, listen, fully 20% of those people only open their Bible once or twice in a whole year. People who come to church every week, one in five, or actually a little over, one in five, they never open their Bible at all. They're not reading. They're not taking anything. Excuse me, 6% never do it. Never do it. Beloved, can I just be perfectly honest with you and say, those people are not exercising themselves unto godliness. Okay, they're not. No matter what they think they're doing, no matter what they hope they're doing, they are not exercising themselves for the purpose of godliness. Just stop for a second and think about what Jesus had to say on this subject. 
It's not like we're ignorant about what Jesus thinks. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12. You can leave 1 Timothy. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12. Look with me at what he says in verse 3. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 3. Jesus is speaking. Let's back up here to um, verse number 2 so that you see the context. When the Pharisees saw it, right, they saw the disciples plucking the ears of corn. They said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Verse 3, he said to them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? Is everybody with me about what he said? Haven't you read? Look down in verse 5. Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Right? The story of the disciples plucking ears of corn and that he justifies that from David, that's from the book of First and Second Samuel. Here he says, haven't you read in the law? He's talking about Leviticus. Let's skip forward a little bit to Matthew chapter 19. Look down in verse 4. Matthew 19 in verse 4. Again, it's the Pharisees that he's speaking with. In verse 4, he answered and said to them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Of course, there's from Genesis. Skip forward to chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, look in verse 31. Now he's talking about the resurrection. He says, But as touching the, resurre uh, the, the resurrection of the dead... Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. All right? So, listen, I, I could go on and on. There's many, many more passages of Scripture where the same thing is said. But based on these verses alone, can you see what the assumption is that is built into these questions? I mean, it's, it's clearly Jesus, it's clear Jesus assumed that these people, these are, he's talking to Pharisees in most of these cases, and the Pharisees claimed to be the people of God. They claim, hey, we're following God. We know the Lord. And so Jesus says, okay, for those people who claim to love God, who claim to be, to be in a relationship with him, who claim to know him, I should just be able to assume that those people would have read God's word. I mean, that's clearly the assumption that he's, that he's operating with. And not only that, but based upon the way that he phrases the question and the citations that he gives, I think it's pretty clear that he expected them to be familiar not just with one or two proof texts, but with the entire canon of Scripture. I mean, he quotes things from Leviticus, from Genesis, from Exodus, from the prophets, from the Psalms, from the stories in the life of David, all over the place. Jesus expects us not to just know the, the classic stories of Noah and the ark or, you know, Jonah and the whale or Daniel and the lion's den. He expects you to know about who King Ahasuerus is. Does everybody know where that's from? Esther? Right? He expects you to know. All, what's the theme of the book of Galatians? He expects you to understand. Be familiar with the entirety of God's words. Does everybody understand this morning? That is an assumption that Jesus has for those of us who claim to be God's people, claim to be following God. It's just right. He has the right to expect that we would be reading his word and be familiar with it. Okay? Now, someone says, well, man, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, preacher. I'd really like to be that way, but I just can't. I just can't. And I want to say, sure you can. Yes, you can. Okay? Yes, you can. All you need is a plan. You just need some help. And that is why we put together, my wife so graciously put together a Bible reading schedule. And they're available on the tables out in the foyer. So when you leave, you've got what you need. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right? They're available right outside. And if you, listen, if you'll just take one and stay on the schedule... You will read completely through the Bible this year. Amen. Can I encourage you? That's a wonderful accomplishment. There are so many Christians that have never read the Bible 
Hardly at all, let alone all the way through. Maybe you're in that boat. If you are, make 2024 the year that you read all the way through the Bible. Amen? Amen. You can do it. You'll learn all kinds of stuff. And it'll be a fascinating journey. It'll be helpful for you. It'll be a great spiritual discipline. And all you've got to do is just get a plan and stay on it. It's a five-day reading plan. So you've got two cheat days where you can kind of, if you miss a day, you have an opportunity to make it up. It's not on Sunday, so it's just Monday through Friday. Literally, you can read all the way through the Bible. You say, man, I just don't have time. You have, don't have time to read a couple pages? Are you sure about that? Because literally, to read through the entire Bible in a year, you only have to read three chapters a day. It's not long. A couple of pages. You can do it. And I want to encourage you to do that. And I, I would like for you to, obviously, you can follow on whatever plan you want to. If you have your own plan, if you're already doing it, perfectly fine. Keep, at it, keep it, whatever you're doing to stay on it. But if you would like to follow our plan, there's a couple benefits for doing that. First of all, it helps to keep you accountable. If we're all on the same plan, it helps to keep you accountable. Because everyone in the whole church knows where you're supposed to be reading. Is everybody listening to me? Amen. They'll know that this week you were supposed to be reading all those genealogies in 1 Chronicles 1 through 10. Right? They'll actually, they'll know where you're supposed to be. Or the sacrifices in Leviticus 1 through 10. You'll, they'll know where you're supposed to be. And they can ask you about it and they can say, did you have any idea what that was talking about? And you can say, no, did you? <laughs> Right, that's perfectly fine, right? But at least we'll all be together, and, and accountability is a wonderful thing. You know, when my wife and I were in Florida, she'll re immediately remember this. When we were in Florida, we went to this church, a pretty good-sized church, bigger than us, a bigger church than we are, and we went in, we sat down the service, we had a good time, and when we came out, we, we entered one way through a little hallway, when we came out, we were exiting the main sanctuary doors, and our car was parked on this side, and we went out that door, and so when we came out we had to go through the foyer that direction and as I walked down the little center aisle I noticed between the doors they had these big dry erase boards huge ones that fit all the way through there and on the dry erase boards it was the dry erase boards were ruled right they had little lines all the way across it it had all the books of the Bible at the top and down the left hand column it had every single person in the church's name no one was exempt. Every person, their name was on the board. And they had little dots, little magnetic dots, and it showed where you were in your Bible reading. I thought, whoa, that's intense. And everybody's dot was in a little bit different place. Most of the dots were caught up to where they were supposed to be. You know why? Accountability. Everybody's name was up there. You could see. And the sermon that we were there to listen to, he preached a message called, Get Fat on the Word of God. It was a good message, right? He said, before the lean times come, you want to be fat on the Word of God. And so he had a plan to help everybody read all the way through their Bible that year. And the accountability of seeing your name on the board and seeing where your dot is helped everybody stay up with it. Is everybody with me about that? Now, I'm not planning on putting out dry erase boards in the foyer, but I am saying, hey, let's all stay on the same schedule. That would help us to be accountable one to another because we're supposed to provoke each other to love and good works. Amen. Amen. These are a good discipline to practice with. So it's good for accountability. Secondly, and in my mind just as important, when everybody is reading in the same place, then God has the opportunity to speak to us all about the same thing at the same time. You know, man, somebody says, I wish God would speak to me. Read the Bible, he will. This is how God speaks to us, is through his word. And so when we're all listening and reading God's word together, then God can, can deal with us simultaneously about something. And we're able to discuss his word when we come together because we're all in it at the same place. And so if everybody stays on board, it just goes a long way toward helping us be unified. All right? So it's a great thing to do. But whether you follow our plan or another one, the important thing is that you read your Bible. Get into this book. Read all the way through it. It's not hard, and you can make it. And so that'd be a great accomplishment. Most people cannot say that they've read the Bible all the way through, but you can this year, if you will. All right, now, what other ways are there to take in God's Word than simply reading it or hearing it preached? Well, <clears throat> you can't do these without reading it. 
But as an advance upon mere reading, you can also learn to study your Bible. Now, it's one thing to have basic familiarity with the Bible. And again, I think that you should. I think you should know all the stories. Right? You should be able to, to instantly recognize the characters of the Bible and know where the stories come from. Those are all good things. But it's something else. That, that's, that's level one, I would say. But it's something else to start thinking about, like, for example, the genre of Scripture or the main characters of the story and how the author is using them to teach us about God and his interactions with the world. Reading is one thing, but when you take a little bit of time to stop and reflect on the story and be able to say, okay, here's who's being dealt with. This is about, let's take Daniel, his interactions with Gabriel. What is God, what is the author doing with this? What's he trying to help us see? What is he teaching us about God? Again, talking about the genre. Stories don't communicate the same way poems do. So how do we learn these things? All right, so you're, if you'll take some time and really study and spend time with the text, you'll find, as I do, that simply taking the time to answer those basic questions, that is enough to vastly change your understanding. So many times we have an impression about what the text means. I, I can't even tell you the number of times. If you've been coming here any length of time, you know that I preach through books of the Bible. One chapter this week, the next chapter, and just moving on through it. That's one thing, reason I don't like special days, because then I have to go figure out what to preach, right? Otherwise, I just know it's the next text, right? And when I preach the next text, nobody, you're, you, can be, can, you can rest assured that I'm not targeting you, right? Because this was the next passage that was in, the, in there, right? And so I don't like to preach topical messages, I don't think that's the way the Bible was intended to be preached. But when you start, <clears throat> when you start, um, when you preach topical messages, a lot of times I'll have in my mind, oh, this text would be good for that. I'll preach this passage for Easter or this passage for Thanksgiving or whatever. That'd be a good text for that. And then I'll go to that text and start studying it and realize this is not a good text for that. Because I thought it said taught one thing, but when I actually got into it, I found out it taught something completely different. Is everybody with me? Well, all of us are that way. We all have impressions about what we think the Bible says. But if you'll take the time to actually study and answer some questions, you'll realize many, many times it doesn't say what you thought it did. It doesn't say. Me and my family were just in a conversation last night or the night before about the Christmas story. About... What does the word in mean? There was no room for them in the inn. Where were the wise men? When did they show up? Everybody thinks it, has, it was at such, such a time, and the Bible teaches it was at some other times, right? And it's probably not what you think. I would challenge you to go back and see it. Because just the other day, I was thinking that the wise men didn't come until Jesus was over a year old. After doing some study this week, I found out that wasn't true. You might learn something. If you'll study, I don't know how to study. Well, get your study Bible. They'll help you with it. If you really want some instruction, you can come bother me and I'll, I'll help you with that. Okay. I'll give you some exercises that'll hurt your brain. Okay. So these are all good things to do, but I, I want to encourage you to study because you'll have your misconceptions or your faulty memories of the story can actually be corrected. And this happens a lot when we're dealing with texts with which we're familiar things like Christmas or Easter, you'll learn a lot. So I'm just saying that studying is a vastly different exercise than reading. And when you study something, you are deeply investing your time and attention in what you're reading. You know what this means? It means you may have to slow down a little bit. You may not be able to read, you know, 50 chapters a day if that's what you're into. You may have to slow down and spend on just a few verses. That's fine. But the good thing is, a text like the Bible will richly reward that investment, and you'll learn more about ancient history, about cultures. You'll be exposed to challenging moral and philosophical concepts. And most significantly, you'll come to understand more and more about your God. That's really what it's about, and his love for you. And in that respect, 
You can expect to be changed by your study of the Bible. And you can really see this in the life of an Old Testament character who took Bible study seriously. I want you to turn with me really fast to the book of Ezra in the Old Testament. Look with me at this, the Old Testament book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 7. And verse number 10. Ezra chapter 7 and verse number 10. And here the Bible says that Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now notice the first thing that went into this. Before he could study, he had to what? Prepare his heart. That's what we're trying to do this morning is get our heart prepared, have some desire to spend time in God's word. Ezra prepared his heart. Next, we're told that he was seeking the law of the Lord. The word seeking literally means he was studying it. Okay, he was studying it. But not only was he studying it, he was also putting what he learned into practice. In other words, he was not simply a hearer of the word. He was a doer of the word also. What he learned he tried to obey, he tried to follow, and finally, he was teaching the statutes and judgments of God to the people, right? So before he ever taught the Word of God, he practiced what he learned. But as was learning came from a study of Scripture, and before he studied, he first prepared his heart. In other words, Ezra disciplined himself to study God's Word. He was exercising himself unto godliness. Oh, dear friends, this is what I want in my own life. This is what I want to be like. This is the pattern I want to follow. I want to know the joy and the growth that comes from preparing my heart and studying God's word and learning what he expects from me and putting that into practice. And I want that for you too. But it's not possible without these steps. All right, so is everybody with me about studying the Bible? You can do this. You can do this. Now, a fourth Bible intake, or, or discipline rather, that helps take... Uh, help you take in the Bible, and what that will help you grow in godliness, probably faster than anything else you can do, is to memorize Scripture. To memorize Scripture. Now, when I say memorize Scripture, here's what happens. And by the way, I just want to remind you of something. How many of you can see me? You can see me right now. Did you know that if you can see me, I can also see you. Uh oh, is right. Because when I say you should practice memorizing scripture, do you know what you look like? You want me to demonstrate? Some of your eyes just completely glaze over. Others of you are like, I can see you. <laughs> okay. Rolling eyes, sighing, or there's this internal thing that's like, I just can't, uh, preacher, I can't do that. I'm 70 years old, I can't memorize anymore, whatever it is. <laughs> See? See? Okay. Now listen, I understand it's not as easy as it once was. Where I, our mind, we're not five, we don't have a little sponge for a brain. I get that. It takes more work. But, I'm going to say this, if I offered you $1,000 for every verse that you could memorize in the next seven days, exactly, <laughs> miracles would break out all over the congregation, wouldn't they? <laughs> There's no question about it. Your attitude towards scripture memory would, and <laughs> your ability to memorize would suddenly be revolutionized, okay? I'm just saying... We could memorize God's word if we wanted to. And the Bible says that God's word is more precious than rubies. It's much more valuable than $1,000. If we wanted to, most of us could memorize some scripture. And we should want to. For several reasons. We ought to want to do this. Okay? 
memorizing God's word gives us spiritual power. Do you understand that? It gives us spiritual power. Think back. We're about to be to this section of scripture in Luke. But think back to the story of Jesus being tempted of the devil. He was driven of the, uh, driven of the spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. And he was out there being tempted by the devil. And every time that Satan comes to him in the wilderness and Satan like thrust a temptation at Jesus, the Lord parried that temptation with the sword of the spirit. Right, He knew it was his recollection of specific verses that helped Jesus to experience victory. Now listen, friends, none of us in here is better than Jesus. None of us in here is better than Jesus. If we want more victory, more wins in our spiritual life, we need to do what Jesus did. Memorize the scripture. Memorize the scripture. So that we have it ready when we need it most. You don't have time. Right? Uh, Change the illustration here. If I'm, if somebody's going to come up and mug me, right, if I'm going to be robbed, the gun at home in my safe does me no good. I got to have it ready. Is everybody following the illustration here? Well, when Satan comes to attack you, having your Bible at home on your desk does you no good. You need to have it internally ready so that you can just say, hey, no, this is wrong. That's not what God wants because he says X or Y or Z. You got to have the Bible with you. It's got to be internally. This is exactly uh, what David had in mind when he wrote. Listen to what Psalm 119 verse 11 says. Somebody can probably help me quote this. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. He was in turn, he had memorized God's truth. He had reflected on it deeply. He had meditated on its meaning. He understood how to use it. And it, it was for the purpose in David's life so that when he faced temptation, he was equipped to resist it. You want spiritual power? You want victory in your life? Memorize the word of God. It's not that hard to say, well, I I can't memorize a verse today. Okay, don't memorize a verse today. Memorize a verse a week. Memorize a verse a month. Memorize a verse. What I really would, I I used to love this. I used to call them the dealers. We had all these people around here who were dealing candy to the kids, like little drug lords or something. And the kids would come by, and, and so we finally stopped letting them just have candy and said, you can't have it without saying a Bible verse. Right. Amen? Amen? That's good. I want to change it, though, because no, I don't think you ought to be able to say the same verse every week. <laughs> okay? You learned one verse, and now you're candy for life? No, that's not going to get it. So what I would like to do is just start, I, I even have a catechism. For us, a catechism is just a training device that answers biblical, it helps you learn, learn biblical truth. I have a catechism that is nothing but Bible verses. And I think we ought to just go through a different verse each week. And if you want candy, you have to know that verse. Amen? Amen. That probably wouldn't hurt any of us as adults to learn that verse. One a week, we could do that. And sharpen ourselves, prepare ourselves for some of the most commonly asked questions. Like, for example, how do you know that Jesus is God? Where does the Bible say Jesus is God? A lot of people are smart alecks about that. Well, you can take them to this passage, that passage, the other passage, if you know them. Right? So I I think it ought to be helpful for us to practice learning some scripture. Secondly, memorizing God's word prepares us to witness and even to counsel others. Okay? Okay? You may remember the story. Remember Acts chapter 2? It's the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. A huge portion of them got saved as a result of Peter's sermon. And Peter's sermon consisted of scriptures that he quoted from memory. He didn't write a sermon and take it out there and it's like, okay, everybody listen, we're going to... No. He quoted those scriptures from memory. Dear friends, 
his experience illustrates perfectly how God can use us if we have God's word hidden in our heart. We become powerful and spiritually dangerous. We're like a living weapon, right? This is the sword right here, but we become a living embodiment of that, constantly ready for God to deploy us in spiritual warfare when we have his word hidden in our heart. And last, certainly not least though, Memorizing scripture prepares us and in fact leads us into meditation. Which is perhaps the number one thing commanded of us with regard to God's word. Psalm 119, again, verse 97. The psalmist cried, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I meditate on God's word all day. How do you do that? What was he walking around like we do with our phones? No. No. He had the word of God with him internally, and he's chewing it over and over. What does God mean by this? By the way, a lot of times when you, people say, I don't like to read the Bible, I don't know what it means. Well, welcome to the club. <laughs> That's the whole point in meditation. We don't know what it means necessarily until we stop and really think. Maybe do a little study on it. Is everybody following me this morning? Okay? Meditate. David had it memorized. When you have a verse of scripture memorized, you can meditate on it anywhere, at any time, during the day or night, whether you're driving in your car or riding in the train or standing in line or rocking a baby or eating a meal, you can benefit from the spiritual discipline of meditation if you have made the deposits of scripture into your memory. Now, I haven't even covered this morning meditating, really, or applying God's word, which are the two most important disciplines of all. They are so important, in fact, that God gives an explicit promise of success if we will give ourselves to these two disciplines. Go with me to the book of Joshua, please. Joshua. Way back at the beginning. Look at what God says, if I can get to it, in verse number, chapter 1, verse number 8, Joshua 1, verse number 8. Joshua 1 and verse 8, look at what he says. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt, listen, meditate therein. How often? day and night, that thou mayest observe to do. What's he talking about there? Obeying the word, right? Yeah. Putting it into practice, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, friends, right there it is in black and white. I mean, I can't say it any clearer than that. If you want to have a successful new year, you want 2024 to be a success? Oh, God, I'm just praying that God will give me success this year. Hey, I got the formula. Here it is. You want to be a success? You're going to have to be in this book. It's that simple. You're going to have to be here to listen to it as it is preached and taught. You're going to have to read it for yourself. You're going to have to spend a little time studying it. You're going to have to memorize it and meditate on it and do it. But if you'll do those things, God says, right here, you'll have good success. I mean, friend, this is not a bad thing. Bible intake is not a bad thing. It's like, this is not like getting up every morning at 530 to go run five miles. That's a bad thing. Oh, come on. None of you have even tried. You just gave up altogether. That's what the issue there is. Hey, man, who wants to go walk a Stairmaster? Forget that. Right? We, those are bad things. Reading the Bible is not a bad thing. Okay, this is a wonderful thing because if you'll get into this book, God himself promises you success. You will grow in godliness. You will come to know your creator, your redeemer. This is what God wants for you. So... As we prepare ourselves for the time of invitation, let me just encourage you this morning. What's the message title? I want to help you make a spiritual New Year's resolution. Okay, I'm urging you to do this, okay? 
I want to encourage you as we stand here in just a minute, we're going to have a verse of invitation. I want to encourage you, make a resolution. Make the decision. You don't need forever to decide, right? We don't have to like slowly ramp up to it over a couple of months to make up our mind. We've looked in the Bible. We know what it says. Let's make the decision. Amen? Amen. Let's just make the decision and say, okay, God, this is something that needs to happen in my life. So I'm going to come and I'm just going to say, God, this year, I want to read through the Bible. I'm going to get a Bible reading schedule, and I'm going to read through the Bible this year. Lord, I'm going to learn a verse. Now, I'm not going to promise to memorize the whole New Testament, but I'm going to learn a verse. Okay, we can do that. I'm going to read, I'm going to study, I'm going to try to stay up with this and be accountable to these things. I want to encourage you. Make the resolution. Be here every time the doors are open so that you can hear the word of God. You know, that passive listening to the word of God and and being taught what it means and how it applies is a good thing for you. Make the decision. You're going to be here every time the doors are open so you can hear God's word proclaimed. Make the commitment to read it all the way through this year. Determine to memorize enough verses to, to share the gospel if need be. To memorize a psalm to encourage you in your prayer life. But just come today and resolve to make God's word an indispensable part of your daily life. You can do it. Just decide that you're going to. Let's stand together, please. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you today. And we want to thank you for your word. It is the most precious gift ever given to man. Lord, I I know that the Bible is the most purchased, the best-selling book of all time. But so many of us have have a Bible, but it just sits on the shelf. It's only read when we come to church. God, help us not to be that way. Help me, God, to have a to set a good example of reading and studying and memorizing the Scripture, meditating upon it. Or maybe be like David and say, "Oh, how I love Thy law! It is my meditation all the day." God, would you help us as Your people to? prioritize Bible intake. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Several have already come. I want to encourage you. Let's just have a great turnout. Let's just come and make the decision. Make the resolution. This year, I'm going to read the Bible.